Good morning and welcome out to Port Norris Baptist Church Adult Sunday School class. I am Ken Wilford. I have been the Adult Sunday School teacher here for many years and I hope you can join us today and go through our Sunday School class with us. We've been studying through the book of Hebrews and we're in Hebrews chapter number 11. Um, I'm actually going to start here on our 12th lesson. If it goes well, maybe I'll go back and do the earlier ones and post them up online so that people can uh, watch them and kind of go along with us if they're coming <clears throat> from somewhere else. But we want to just say that Port Norris Baptist Church is a small, independent, fundamental Baptist church in southern New Jersey. Um, and we hope that these lessons are going to be a blessing to you. I'm going to try to do my best teaching them. So you can enjoy them with me and also learn some things. And my prayer is that you would take one thing from this lesson and be able to use it this week uh, in your life. All right, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer to get started with our lesson today. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us be able to be here through this format and be able to study your word together. Pray bless those that are watching today that you would just help them to trust you, Lord, during our trying times we're living in, and also get something from this lesson. Maybe there's some people that are watching today that have never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I pray they would do that today, and you would just bless our time. We ask in Jesus, and we pray. Amen. All right, this is our lesson today. So we're in Hebrews chapter 11. We've been in Hebrews 11 for probably the last 11 weeks. So we're going to continue on. Today's lesson is called Through Faith. And, you know, as you may or may not know, Hebrews 11 is considered, it's called the Hall of Faith. Okay, so many times as you're hearing people talk about it, teaching through it, it's called the Hall of Faith. It's called that because it's talking to us about faith, what is faith, and also what are some great examples of it. And so in uh, Hebrews 11, we're going to read verses... 32 through 40 to get started. It says, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, and they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So today's lesson is called Through Faith. That's what we're talking about this morning. One of the things you have to ask yourself is who are the great people? Right? Who are the people that are considered great? And I know in our lives sometimes people consider people who are very wealthy to be the great people. Sometimes people consider the people who are very powerful in the government to be the great people or people who have invented great inventions or discovered great discoveries. Sometimes people who have traveled around the world and learned things from other cultures and things, they're considered great. But in the Word of God, the people that are considered great are those who allow the Lord to be great in their lives. Okay, and that's the people that we're going to be talking about this morning. Yes, they did accomplish some amazing things, but the things they accomplished, they accomplished because they had faith and they allowed God to do a work in their life. And so that's what I'm hoping you folks will be learning from this lesson today, myself as well. Um, and so, because we should all desire to be great. Not that we're going to be, you know, our face is going to be on Time Magazine and we're going to be uh, celebrated in the media and pop culture and all this other stuff. Uh, the, really, the one person that we should be concerned about 
is God himself. Okay, And so these lives of these people, they were living through faith. Okay, Through faith. That is supposed to be the way we live our lives as Christians. You know, we're supposed to be living what we call the faith life. The faith life. And so in Hebrews 1, 11, 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, so that is uh, what faith is. Okay, it's a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We're not talking about faith uh, for the sake of faith alone. So in other words, I have these positive thoughts about life. I have these positive thoughts about others. I have, you know, I'm going to, you know, envision me being successful, being, you know, all these different things. Um, that's not what we're talking about. Not faith for the sake of faith. If we wanted to talk about that, we would be selling you a copy of our book, you know, The Power of Positive Thinking, which I don't have and I've never read. But, uh, you know, that's people that say, hey, faith itself, that's what is important. And faith, faith, faith. But that's not what the Bible says. Okay? The faith has to have an object. Okay? So, uh, you know, other religions around the world, they say, clear your minds. Let's just focus on nothing. Okay? Let's just clear our minds, try to get ourselves to a state of nothingness. Okay? That's not what God is trying to teach us here in His Word. He is saying instead that we are supposed to have an object of our faith, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, So, again, in the Christian world, we have to be careful because sometimes people have their faith in a person who is a speaker, okay, who is a great speaker, a great preacher of the Bible, or just some kind of personality. Maybe they're in the Christian music world, maybe they are, you know, even making these Christian movie things that are coming out, and they say, oh, I just love that person, I think they're amazing, I think, you know, they are my hero, my superstar, um, okay, I mean, you're not really supposed to put people on that level in the Christian world, why not? Because what happens when that person, when that person who has feet of clay, because they are a human being, what happens when they fall off of their perch? Okay, and it will happen. So, you know, again, our object of our faith should be the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John 15, verses 1 through 5, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that might bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Nothing. Not every, most stuff. This is what most people think. Like, I can do 99.9% .9 of things by myself. And when I get into the situation where, you know, I'm in a trench during the First World War, the rockets and bombs are flying over, and the mustard gas is coming in, and the enemy is coming and attacking from all sides, then I'm going to pray like there's no tomorrow and ask God to help me out because I cannot possibly get out of the situation any way, shape, or form. <laughs> okay? That's not the kind of faith that God wants. Instead, He wants a faith that realizes that you can't do anything without Him. So, get up in the morning. Get out of bed. Put on your socks. You need the Lord for that. Okay, you need the Lord for that. And you need to realize that you can do nothing without Him. Okay, because I know people right now who can't do that. They cannot do that. They took that for granted for many, many years. They had great health. And now they cannot do that. Okay, so if you think you can handle things on your own... Uh, the Lord might bring you to that point to show you that you can't. So, in other words, it's better to realize it now 
when you can do things, okay, on your own, but you choose to do things through God, through the Lord, that's a better where, place to be than to, you say, I can do it all on my own, and then the Lord has to take you to school and teach you, right, that you can't. And sadly, I think a lot of people are going to learn that in, in this situation that's happening right now. I'm not going to get into it. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, so, without me you can do nothing. The great battleground for the Christian is in the hearts and the mind. Okay, the heart and the mind. That's why the Bible talks about keeping those things clean, keeping those things clear, because that's where the actual battles are fought in life, is in the heart and the mind. If I can get a hold of your heart, if I can get a hold of your mind, you know, I don't have to force you to do anything. You, you will do it. Okay, so... You know, you're not going to hear me come on here and tell you this is rules. You have to do these rules. You have to do those rules. Okay. Instead, I'm going to teach you principles that is going to touch your heart, your mind, hopefully. And then you're going to look into the Bible and see what does the Bible say and do what it says on your own. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, so this is how we're supposed to be living. In other words, it's not all about us. Right? It's not all about me and you. It's about him. Okay, some of the old-timey preachers, when they died on their tombstone, was just this. A finger pointing up. Why? Because they had spent their entire life pointing people to the Savior, and when they died, they wanted people to look up, okay, as well. And so that's what we need to be doing. We need to be living for Him, dying to self, okay, it's not about us. So that way, when people say something nice about you, oh, I loved your solo the other week at church, you're like, people are like, mm -hmm. oh, I love it, okay, yes, I'm amazing, okay. But then when somebody comes to you and says, um, can you never sing again? Because that was bad. You can say, you, you know, hey, I'm doing it to the Lord. I'm doing it to the Lord, for the Lord. He told me to do it. He asked me to do it. I'm doing it. And you, you know, I'm sorry you didn't like it, but it's to Him. So if you do it both ways, when people tell you you're doing great, you say, hey, praise God. It's not me, it's Him. When people are telling you you're doing terrible, and why don't you just give up and quit? You're saying, "Hey, listen. He told me to do it. I'm doing it for him. I'm not doing it for you. You're getting the you're getting something out of it yourself. You're getting the benefit of it, but it's not for you. It's for him. It's part of dying to self. And that's a, definitely a good lesson to learn if you're going into the ministry, even or if you're just a regular Christian, because that's how people get their feelings hurt. That's how people get upset and all this other stuff. And it's really a sign of an immature Christian." To have a thin skin. Okay, so if you got a thin skin, you need to ask the Lord for some help on that. Luke 17, 5, one of the disciples asked the Lord, increase our faith. Okay, increase our faith. We don't like saying that. Why not? Because that's when bad stuff happens. <laughs> okay, so it's like when you ask God to increase your patience. Uh, you have bad things happen, so you can get increased patience, so people will stop asking for it. When you say increase our faith, you have bad situations happen. We have a situation happening right now across the world that I am praying is going to increase people's faith. Okay, The scientific community is not going to be enough. The governments of the world are not going to be enough. We need to have God intervene. And people need to be praying. We need to have faith increased. You know, people want their ability to be increased. They say, I'm going to go on YouTube, I'm going to go online, I'm going to learn how to, you know, do these different skills and things. That's great. Okay, they want their ability increased. They want their training increased. They say, I'm going to go to a Bible college, I'm going to maybe do an online Bible college so I can get a degree in preaching, a degree in teaching, a degree in whatever. That's fine. Okay, they want their equipping increased. They say, hey, church, we need... This better equipment, we need a better sound system, we need better you know, instruments to play, all this stuff. That's all great. Okay, that's all fine and dandy. But 
that's no substitute for faith. And so that's the problem you have. Again, we live in a very wealthy nation. We live in a place where, you know, all of these things we can do very without much effort. Okay, and some people love all those things. I like the technology things, okay, but it's not a substitute for faith. And so you have to be careful about trying to substitute these other things and say, hey, we got great programs at our church. We have a great speaker, pastor that's a speaker. He can just say things. People just love to hear him preach. We have, you know, uh, all these things. We have a huge auditorium that's amazing. We have people that play that are amazing. You know, all these things are in place. All these programs, things are in place. Okay, and now it's just going to blow up. We're going to see great things happen. Well, but what about faith, right? That's actually supposed to be number one. But a lot of times we push it to the back. Okay, push it to the back. Well, I'm going to keep going here. I don't want to get too bogged down. So, um, as we go to the end here, closer to the end of this chapter, okay, uh, the person that's writing says, and what shall I say more, let's see, what shall I more say? For time would fail me. Okay, in other words, you know, he could talk forever. I guess you probably think I've been talking forever, but I haven't. <laughs> Uh, he said, time will fail me to talk about all the people in the Word of God that had faith. But we're going to focus on these particular people. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, so it says, through faith they subdued kingdoms. Okay, so it says, time will fail me to tell Gideon of Barak, Samson, and Jephthah of David also, and Samuel, uh, and of the prophets. Okay, in verse 32 he lists these six names. Five are judges, one is a king. Okay, David is the king listed here. The other ones were all judges. It says, through faith, they subdued kingdoms. Okay, they subdued kingdoms. And, you know, we face challenges every day we live. Sometimes the challenges seem insurmountable. Okay, right now there's this virus going around the world. I cannot see this virus. I cannot fight it and punch it in the face and tell it to get out of here, get a shotgun and shoot it, or do anything like that. Okay. Uh, you just do the best you can, what they recommend, but, okay, there is somebody who can deal with it, okay, that is the Lord, and so, you know, we deal with things that are considered insurmountable, okay, in this time period, these judges, they were dealing with being, living in oppression, living under, you know, oppression of these other countries that were taking over uh, Canaan at the time, and then oppressing the, the Jewish people that were there. And yet God would send along a judge who was a military chief to deliver them. Okay, uh, If we desire the victory, we want to subdue kingdoms. It says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay, That's really our fight. Okay. We want to fight. We want to punch people in the face as far as being having a physical enemy to fight. You know, Americans are great at fighting other people if we need to. Okay, World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam. Okay, even the Gulf Wars. We had an enemy that we could face. We could fight. We would we would beat them every time. Why? Because we. That's something that we can wrap our heads around, our minds around. And it's something that we can physically do. So we will love to do that. But as Christians, we have an unseen enemy, the devil. He is working in this world. He wants to send everyone to hell. That is his goal. He's going there. He wants to send everybody there that he can. And so he's going to do whatever it takes. He's going to lie to people. He's going to tell them that they're fine, they don't need to be saved. That he's going to tell them that God is a lie, he's made up story. Okay, so they don't have to, you know, listen to him. He's going to tell them whatever he whatever lie or whatever falsehood they're going to believe uh, to go to hell. Because that's what he wants. He wants to destroy them. He can't destroy God, but he can take a human being who is made after the image of God, he can try to take them down, and so that's what he's going to do. And so that is our battle. Okay, and how do we fight against the devil? Okay, uh, it says the shield of faith, right? Taking the shield of faith, wherewith 
You are able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Okay, so we have a defensive weapon. It is the shield of faith. You know, when somebody comes along and they t try to talk to you about, there's an error in the Bible here. This isn't right. Evolution things are real. You know, all these other things. How do you deal with it? Right? A lot of times you just say, well, you know what? Were you there when, you know, when the universe was created? Nope. Was I there when you were? Nope. There is somebody that was there. He wrote it down. He told us how it happened. And you can read about it. Okay, we definitely have that. We have an eyewitness account from the in the Bible. Scientists, they're going off of what they can see around them and knowledge that isn't complete. That's why they constantly change all the time what they say about this and what they say about that. When I was a kid, the universe was about 3.5 billion years old. I think now it's, I don't even know. It was at 30-something billion. I mean, it's getting older by the second. <laughs> and, uh... Science, because of science, because we're learning things all the time, and we're expanding our knowledge, and, you know, that's how science works. But, you know, people have turned science into a religion that they are saying, I'm going to base my entire life, my entire belief system on science. The problem with science is that it's not complete. It never will be complete. And they can't prove the exist. you can't prove the existence of God with science. You can't disprove the existence of God with science. So, you know, it, this is the big problem I have with be people basing their life on science, okay? And then they try to make disciples, right? They say, I hate that Christians are constantly coming to the door, knocking on the door, bonk, 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 trying to talk to me about the Lord. They're online. They're making these stupid YouTube videos like this one, <laughs> telling people about God and things like that. They should just leave everyone alone. And yet, then they go on to the, you know, on YouTube, go on to uh, Facebook and these other, and other places, and they're telling people, I'm an atheist, and you, I, here's why I don't believe about God this, here's why I don't believe about God that. You know, they have these uh, TED Talks now, where, you know, they basically have a science, quote-unquote science preacher that gets up, and he preaches about, science things and they come together as it's like a church service it looks just like a church service okay so cut me a break okay they're telling us these things and yet and that they don't like people doing this and they're doing the exact same thing i mean the global warming thing is a great example of this they're push trying to push it down our throats and tell us that you're a sinner unless you believe in global warming and you're going to go straight to Global warming, heck, because of it's going to destroy us all. You know, cut me a break. Okay, so at least as Christians, we're honest about what we're doing. We have faith in God. We have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are trying to tell you about him. We are trying to convert you. We do want you to understand that this is the truth. Okay, um, and I'm being honest that way. These other people... They're saying they hate that part about Christianity, and yet they're doing the exact same thing, and they're being dishonest about it, right? And they act all elitist and self-righteous about it. Yeah, all the things that they said they hated about Christians, they do. Okay, I, I think that is the definition of hypocrite. You know, Christians get, again, get uh, accused of being hypocrites. Because sometimes we are. We do things that we shouldn't do. But these people are exactly the same. They are also hypocrites. And so, if I'm going to believe somebody, I'm going to believe the Word of God that's been around for thousands of years versus some rando guy that's on a Facebook post. Alright, that's just me. Alright, I'm get off of that. So, we take the shield of faith when these thing, people bring up these things. We say, hey, I don't understand this all the way, but I'm going to believe God. Okay? And we, it doesn't bother us. Okay? A shield is deflecting things. It says, through faith they subdued kingdoms. They wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. So we see all these different things that we could actually go back and talk about each individual person. Okay, that did that. In the book of Judges, chapter 21, now if you want to go there, 
Uh, we're going to go to Judges 21, verse 25. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Sounds kind of similar to now. Except we do have a, a president, but everybody's doing whatever they want. Judges 6, verses 12 through 13. It says, The angel of the Lord appeared unto him, and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Excuse me. And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. The children of Israel had been delivered into the hands of the Midianites. Okay. Uh, and God appeared to Gideon. The story continues on here. Verse is uh, Judges 6, 14 through 16. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I have, uh, save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. And thou shalt smite the Midians as one man. Okay, so this is the story of Gideon. Of course, you know the story. God gave him an army, and then he whittled it down to 300 men. Um, God told Gideon, Go in this thy might, to bring him to the realization that he couldn't do it in his own might. <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, it's kind of like the same idea as, Why did God give us the Ten Commandments? Okay, some people... Or the commandments in scripture. Some people are like, oh, you gave, gave them to us so we could keep them. And I have to do all of them. Oh, thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. And then if I don't shalt not do everything, I get to go to heaven. Because, you know, brownie points and things. No. Okay. Uh, as you're trying to keep the Ten Commandments, you realize that you can't keep the Ten Commandments. You're going to break the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Uh, we're always telling stories and lying in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and yet, you know, we think we people think they can keep them and go to heaven. They are just lying to themselves. What is the purpose of the Ten Commandments? To show us we can't keep them, and we need to be saved. We need God's salvation. What is the purpose of God telling Gideon to go in this thy might, and you're gonna do it? Is to get Gideon to admit, hey, you know what? I need God. I can't do this by myself. And then God whittles his team down to 300 guys. For the exact same reason. They were fighting against an impossible enemy anyway. They had a decent, a semi-decent army, but it was still super outnumbered. And God's like, listen, I want to show you something. We're going to whittle this team down to 300 guys, and we're not even going to have weapons. We're going to have a torch in one hand and a trumpet in the other hand. And you got your sword, but you are not got it in your hand. Right? You know the story. And so God did that to show people... It was by faith. When the victory was won, it was by faith. Okay, It was not by might. In 2 Corinthians 12.10, it says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Okay, This is Paul talking. He says, God had told him in the ninth verse, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Okay, That is a something that we need to learn. You know, God wants us to know that we can't really do it on our own. Okay, If you think you're going to heaven because of how good and nice you are, I don't doubt that you're a good and nice person. I'm not saying you're you know, Adolf Hitler or something like that. You're probably a nice person. People, When we try to talk to people about the Lord and tell them about how to be saved, you say, have you ever sinned? They said, well, I've never killed anyone. Like, Number one, I'm like, wow, that's relief. <laughs> okay. Thank you for not being a murderer. Okay. But that's not good enough. You're not going to get to heaven because you never murdered anyone. Okay. Um, and you're not going to get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments. Instead, we get to heaven because we put our faith, our object of our faith is Jesus Christ. We realize we're a sinner. We admit that to ourselves, which is the hardest part, to be honest. We admit that to the Lord, who already knows it already. And then we say, Lord, I'm sorry, I, I'm a sinner, I don't want to be one anymore, I want to be saved. Please, you know, come into my heart, save me, I accept what Jesus did on the cross, I believe that he died on the cross for my sins, that he rose again from the dead, and he went to heaven, 
and I accept what he did, please save me, and he will do that. Okay, it's really that easy, but you do it by faith. You accept it by faith, and it's a work of the Holy Ghost. And once we call upon, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so we call upon him, we ask him to forgive us our sins, we ask him to come into our heart and to save us, and if we mean it, right, then he's going to do his part. He's going to save you. And you're going to be saved. And that, But you only get saved when you realize that it's by faith. Okay, again, as a Christian, even you can live by in two ways. You can live by faith, which is how it's designed. Or you can live by force. In other words, you're going to manipulate everyone. You're going to try to force people into doing what you want them to do. And I've, I've known people like this. They try to guilt trip everybody into doing things for them. You know, it doesn't work for me. It makes me want to do the opposite when people try to guilt trip you and make you feel bad and make you feel like you're a terrible person unless you do X, Y, Z. Instead, I want to do it by faith. Okay? And then when you're doing it, you not only are doing it for by faith, which is how you're supposed to do it, but you're doing it for the right reasons. Okay, all that good stuff. So, um, you know, we want to be living by faith, not by force. Again, as people look for a preacher out there, they're looking for this most handsomest man you can possibly imagine. They're looking for the most eloquent preacher you can possibly imagine. We're looking for a man who wears suit that costs two thousand dollars, and he could be a model on television. I know our pastor is saying, yes, this describes me perfectly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> and, you know, it may, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> that's not, that's what people want because that's what our flesh thinks is going to be the person that people are going to respect and listen to the most. But instead, we should be looking for a person of faith. And, you know, that's why I love our pastor because that is him to a T. Okay? He is a man of faith. He loves people. He loves the Lord. He's not perfect, but he is a great man in faith. Okay, That is the measure of a man or a woman. And so that's who we should look for if we're looking for a pastor. Okay, let's keep going. Judges chapter 4, okay, verses 1 through 3, it says, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, and Ehud was dead when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whom hand was Sisera, or ha captain of whose host, I'm sorry, and dwelt in Harasheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had nine hundred chariots of iron, and tw twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Again, the children of Israel were under oppression. This time they were under the oppression of Jabin for twenty years. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, verses 4 through 6. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at the time, and she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Ahinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun? Now let's go to verses 14 through 16. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thy hand. Is not the Lord going out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor, and ten thousand men after him. And the Lord discomfited Sisera, and all his chariots, and all his hosts, with the edge of the sword before Barak. So Sisera lighted down off his chariot, and fled away on his feet. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Harasheth of the Gentiles. And all the hosts of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Okay, So Deborah was used to encourage Barak. You know, Again, we read in Hebrews 11, it doesn't name Deborah. It names Barak okay, as the person of faith. So how did De Barak become a person of faith? Because Deborah was encouraging him. Right? She was encouraging him to have faith in God. His faith was not that great, but he did listen to her. He did listen to her encouragement, and it helped him. Okay, It helped him to subdue kingdoms. 
Okay, so let's continue on. So we talked about subduing kingdoms. We have a kingdom to subdue here in our world, the kingdom of the devil. We need to be working for that. Okay, sorry my computer decided to go to sleep. Uh, then it says, through faith they suffer for righteousness sake. For righteousness sake. So many people are suffering in the world, but not all suffer for their faith. Okay, if you ever read a thing called Fox's Book of Martyrs, I would encourage that as a Christian. It will change your worldview. It will make you understand why people came to America. Some people, right? Why did the pilgrims come here? Because those people and the people before them had suffered in Europe and around the world for their faith. They tried a few times to go off on their own in Europe. They went into the mountains. They went into the valleys, places that other people couldn't get to, to try to start their own little villages and communes and things to get away from the Catholic Church, get away from even the other quote-unquote you know, Christian churches that were persecuting them, state churches. It didn't work. They would always find them. They would hunt them down. They would round them up. Okay, uh, There were stories about parents who taught their children the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer, and then they tied them all up together and put them to death for their faith. Okay? There was a story about Lady Jane Grey, who was the nine-day queen of England, who would not de deny her faith. She had her head cut off at 16 years of age because she would only trust in Jesus Christ and his shed blood for her salvation. Okay, again, people thought they were trying to help people to get them to believe in Mary and believe in the Catholic Church doctrine. They would torture people mercilessly. The Inquisition. Right? Torture people mercilessly because they said, oh, we'll deliver their souls. But instead, they were torturing the wrong people. They were torturing the people that actually believed the truth of the Word of God a lot of times, instead of just random people. And so, you know, this went down through time. Even today, there are people who are tortured, who are imprisoned. Okay? Uh, when I was in Bible college, we had a bunch of people from Romania. That had came, of course, from Romania. It used to be part of the former Soviet Union, and during that time period, you had you could be persecuted for your faith. And so they had underground churches. They would meet in the woods. They would sing really low, so people wouldn't hear. They'd meet in basements, and yet their preachers would still get arrested. They would be put in jail for their faith. I think they said at the time their pastor had been in jail for 20 years for preaching the gospel. This was back. In the 90s, this is not a long time ago, okay? Even today in China, right, the church there is growing, but it's underground. We have a missionary there now who I'm not going to name. I can't put any information about him online because the Chinese government would come and kick him out of the country because they're not supposed to have Christian missionaries there. So they're being oppressed, but uh, they're still serving the God. The Bible says others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, they might obtain a better resurrection. Okay, so God has promised people that are putting you know, Him above their own personal safety that they are going to have a better resurrection. It says others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. In 1 Peter 1 7, it says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so. God has promised these people rewards in heaven because they had to suffer here for him. Okay, uh, In Hebrews 11 again, verses 36 through 37, it says, Moreover, a bonds, an imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder. Okay, Being sawn asunder, he says, happened to, we don't have it in the scriptures, but tradition says it happened to Isaiah. Okay, Isaiah, he was sawn asunder. They put him in, I think the thing is that he got put inside of a log. And, you know, they tried to do that magic trick where you saw the person in half, except there wasn't a magic trick, okay? And he, but he, he died that way because he served God. I mean, you read the book of Isaiah, he's somebody that was telling people about the Lord. He was even telling people about Jesus before Jesus came on the scene. It says they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. James, the brother of John, was beheaded with a sword by Roman, by the Romans. Uh, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. They were destitute, afflicted, tormented, okay, of whom the world was not worthy. 
They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Okay, this is the reality that since Christianity started, okay, up until about the 1600s or so, this was the this was the lot of people that actually believed the truth of the word of God. And if they wanted to keep their faith, they had to sacrifice. And yet today in our land in the United States, if our heater doesn't work just right, right, we're upset because it's chilly in the church. If our air conditioner doesn't work just right, we're upset because it's chilly, it's hot in the church. If our sound system is malfunctioning, right, making some noises or just turns off, we get upset. If our seats are too hard or too soft, if the carpet is the wrong color, if the curtains are the wrong color, uh, if the pre pastor preaches too long, you know, all this stuff. And we have, we're spoiled, but we need to get past it, okay? <laughs> we need to deny ourselves, okay? Die to self, because a lot of other people are suffering for real. We need to understand that and say, you know what? It's not that big of a deal, Okay? I'm sure they'll handle it. It'll be fine. Okay, so let's keep going. So we see they uh, suffered for righteousness' sake, and the last thing we see here is they stayed the course. I'm trying to wrap it up here. They stayed the course. Okay, um, all these things is verses 39. All these things having, and these all having obtained a good report through faith. Okay, they had a good report. Okay, they had a good report through faith. They went through these things. The apostle Paul said, "I have fought the good fight." I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, 7. Okay, and Paul went through a lot. And yet, Paul stayed the course. Okay, America, Christianity has been a Christianity of convenience. Sadly. I remember when I was in the South, in the early 90s, there was a church on every corner in Chattanooga, Tennessee. In Georgia, where my wife grew up, there was a church everywhere. And... Here was what some of the people were doing. They were jumping from church to church to church to church to church every week, every month, every six months, right? They would go to another one. And sometimes it was even, you know, sometimes because the preacher said something, the preacher's wife said something, the preacher's wife wore something, the preacher has a brand new Lincoln Continental or whatever. I mean, just reasons, okay? Uh, but then it got to the point where I was talking to people down south and they're saying, oh, no, no. Uh, we have a softball league, and, um, you know, I like to be on the best softball team that there is. So I moved my, from this one church to this other church because they have an amazing softball team. And so I wanted to be on there, play softball in the soft in the Baptist Church, Independent Fundamental Baptist Church Softball League. Uh, we, You know, that's how many churches there were. <laughs> and so it's all just about sp sports related, okay? Uh, that's just sad. Okay, we should be going to a church that God has called us to. We feel like God is put us there for a purpose. We have a job to do. We're doing things. Uh, it's not about convenience, and it's not about you know being. Oh, I want I want a good youth program. My kids need you know to interact with other Christians. They do. Okay, but I say it's more important to be somewhere where God has put you. That's where you're supposed to be. Okay. Um, you should be in a church right now. We can't be because of this current situation. That's why we're doing this. But this is not a substitute for actually going to church with other believers, uh, having an ordained pastor, not just say, I'm going to be in my pastor now, and I'm going to teach, be my own church. Okay, no, that don't work. We don't see that in the Word of God. The apostles ordained pastors and deacons in every city, and those were the leaders. Okay, so you can't ordain yourself. God has to do it. And how he does it is usually he uses another preacher who has already been ordained. So we have this, you know, or ordination uh, chain that goes all the way back to the disciples. But I'm not going to get off on that. So they stayed the course. Okay, they stayed the course. God has given us a course to run. <laughs> he expects us to continue and do it. Okay, and stay the course. It says, God said, all these obtained a good report through faith. Received not the promise. Okay, so they did all that. And at the end of the day, <clears throat> you 
you know, Jesus hadn't came back. Jesus hadn't came yet. The Messiah hadn't came yet. They were still looking that he was coming through faith. Okay, and yet they did what God told them to do. You know, today we even have even more than they had. Okay, First Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12 says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand that sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which we are now reported unto them by them, that they have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Okay, so God has given us a lot of knowledge. Okay, we're looking back at the Lord that came, that lived a perfect life, that died on the cross, that rose again. These are all things that we know about from God's Word. We have the Word of God, okay, written down, okay, for us. We have it written here. We can look it up. We can read it. They didn't have any of that, okay. They were living completely by faith for what they were expecting. <clears throat> we should be living by faith by what God has already said, God has already done, written out for us. But then we should also be expecting, okay, we should also be expecting, you know, um, the G William Carey, the guy who went to India as one of the first Baptist missionaries, he said, you know, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. That's what we should all be doing. We should be living by faith so that we are expecting the Lord to do something great. So right now, as we look into our time that we're living in, perilous things are happening. Maybe the Lord's fixing to come back. Maybe he isn't. I don't know. Okay, We should be expecting that at any moment. But if the Lord doesn't come back, what is he going to find us doing? Is he going to find us staying true to our course until we leave this world? That's what we should be doing. Okay, And how do we do that? We do that by faith. We do that realizing, hey, the race isn't over yet. I still have things to do. God still has, he's got me here for a reason. As long as I'm here, I need to be serving him. And that's how these people, that's how they got recorded in Hebrews 11. That's how we will be able to stand before the Lord one day and he will say to us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. All right, let me go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for people that are watching it. Lord, I pray you bless them, Lord, today. Again, if there's anyone that has never trusted Christ as their Savior, I pray they would do that today. Pray for those that are saved, that they would get something from this lesson. They could learn to encourage them, and we'll praise your name for that. We ask all these things. Pray blessings on our church. Pray your blessings on our nation and the world right now as we go through uh, a rough time. You would help your people to live by faith through it and be able to come through the other side even more strong in our faith. Now, just God and direct these things, we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you for coming out today for our Sunday School class. If you have a question about salvation, you can put it in the comments. We'll be glad to talk to you privately about that. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week, and we thank you for your attendance here today. This is Ken Wilford at Port Norris Baptist Church, Adult Sunday School class, and we will see you next week.